Greetings War Thunderers, this is Longshot with a guide on how to aim with fighter planes in arcade. In previous videos in this Beginner's Guide series, I've examined the principles of energy fighting, I've shown various defensive and reversal manoeuvres and attacking techniques, but all of those will be of limited value if you can't actually land your shots when it most counts. It's actually very common for new players to struggle even to land hits, let alone actually shoot down planes on a regular basis. So this video covers all topics to do with aiming. I'll show you how to position your plane for the shot and the best approach angles on the enemy plane. I'll discuss weapons, convergence, vertical targeting, allowing for gravity and recoil. And lastly, I'll look at the lead indicator, showing how to interpret it and how to use it to improve the accuracy of your aiming. So if you have annotations enabled right now, you'll see a bunch of links that you can click to skip straight to a particular section of the video. Okay, so to begin with, let me show you two screenshots. Here I am sitting on the tail of an enemy fighter, and here I'm approaching at high speed from an angle. Which do you think of these two scenarios is more likely to get me a quick and easy kill, at minimal risk to my own plane? Well, let's see what happened in the first example. He quickly became aware of me, started dodging and became very hard to hit. From behind, even a large fighter like a P-47 presents a small target, and any armour will be facing to the back to prevent vital components from exactly this kind of attack. So let's look at the second example. This time I have the full top-down profile of the enemy plane to aim at, there's no armour protecting him from my shots, and he's far less likely to be aware of me. It's so much easier to land critical hits and I was able to execute the quick and easy kill with no risk of fixating on the target and developing tunnel vision. So the first lesson to take away from this is that the angle of the enemy plane matters. Directly on the six of a plane is often the worst place to be if you want a quick kill. Now I'm not saying it's impossible to shoot down planes from there, it's just making things unnecessarily difficult for yourself. The more of the enemy plane is exposed to your guns, the larger the target it becomes, making it harder to miss, the less armour there is to stop your shots and the more chance you have of inflicting terminal damage. And it's these kind of deflection shots you want to look for. OK, next, there's the angle of your own plane to consider when you're getting ready to take a shot at a target. Let's consider some basic flights theory. Uh, planes have wings, and those wings generate lift. As a result, planes will be more responsive when you pitch up than when you pitch down. This will be more noticeable with some planes than others, but as a general rule you want to roll your plane so you can pitch up in order to track a target and avoid a situation where you have to pitch down to get a firing solution. This is even more important if your plane is a weak rudder, such as P-47s or P-38s. A weak rudder makes the plane reluctant to yaw to the side, so you want to roll to get your wing angle matching the heading of your target, as that will minimise the amount of rudder needed to get a firing solution. In this example I started to roll the plane to track a target, a KO-45, but when I opened fire I stopped rolling, and as a result my wings go out of alignment with his flight direction. At this point it's actually looking pretty good. There's the enemy flight path and you can see the angle of my wings should allow me to use elevators in order to pitch up as I track the target, but it goes wrong very quickly. I've stopped rolling the plane and the instructor has stepped in and decided to correct my roll angle and make the cockpit face upwards, and this is the result. To follow my target, the plane will now need to yaw to the side, but the rudder on the P-47 just isn't strong enough for that, so as a result I miss the shot and the target escapes. So you have to learn to multitask and concentrate on the roll angle of your plane, even while you're shooting. A guest pilot, Flip, will demonstrate that for us in this diving attack on a hurricane. The hurricane begins a right-hand turn, which will take it under Flip's angle of approach. If you try to simply follow it with the mouse cursor, that will make the plane try to pitch down against the natural lift of the wings. Chances are that he won't get guns on target. So instead he's going to roll the plane and turn it upside down, and as the hurricane continues to turn, Flip continues to roll, even while lining up the shot. And yes, that was a difficult kill, which he made look easy, but now you can see how important rolling the plane can be when it comes to tracking a target and getting a firing solution. OK, the next thing I want to look at is anticipating your target's movements, before you get into firing range. And the idea is to be proactive rather than assume they'll fly straight, and then find yourself having to react when the target does something unexpected. And this is my previous example with the P-47. Having missed the KO-45, I'm now continuing my diving attack on the BB-1, who is flying in this direction. Note how I'm already flying toward where I expect his plane to be. I'm not flying directly at him. This is known as a lead pursuit, and it plays a vital role in positioning your plane for an attack. 
I do have to roll my plane a little to the left to match his heading, but that aside, let's look at what's likely to happen here. The enemy plane could keep flying straight, or he could target one of the blue planes to his left, or he could see me and break hard to either side. Although I'm over a kilometre away, I'm watching closely, and I'm ready to quickly adjust my roll angle and flight direction as needed. As it turns out, he only makes a minor turn to the left, I instantly correct with my roll, I'm in position for a great shot as I reach convergence range. So yes, don't expect your enemy will fly straight while you attack them. Ask yourself what they're likely to do, be ready to adjust while you approach, and you'll be in a much better position to put guns on target. Okay, there's one more thing to cover before I look at aiming itself, and that's the setup and behaviour of your weapons. To begin with, some planes like the P-47 have guns mounted on the wings, and some are on or close to the fuselage, like this I-185, and when you start a battle, you'll be able to set the gun's targeting distance. This distance refers to two things. Firstly, your guns are angled inwards to make the bullets converge at whatever distance you specify here, beyond which they start to disperse again. This is what I and others refer to when we speak of convergence. So let's take a quick look at what convergence means. I'm using a Corsair in this example as it has wing-mounted guns, and here you can see the convergence set to 800 metres. With this setting, you'll be able to damage planes right out to 1km or more, but landing hits from all six of your guns won't be easy, and at close range you might struggle to hit anything at all. At 400 metres you're doing deadly damage at a more typical engagement range, however long-range gunnery is now out of the question. And if you set it to a close value like 250 metres, you'll shred planes at point-blank range, but beyond 400 metres it'll be a waste of time trying to shoot anything. Whatever you choose, if your guns are wing-mounted then it will be a compromise. One thing to take into consideration is the effective damage range of your plane's weapons. Light machine guns are best at close range, 50 cals are losing effectiveness by 500 metres, cannon also lose their ability to penetrate armour at long range, though their high explosive remains just as effective. So if the main guns on your plane are mounted on the wings, it makes sense to set the gun's targeting range at the maximum range at which they'll still inflict serious damage. Lastly, here's a plane with fuselage mounted weapons, which you should always set to a maximum targeting range. If you set it to a short distance, you'll gain nothing as the guns are already close together. All you're doing is sacrificing your long range accuracy. Anyway, the gun's targeting range is not only for horizontal convergence. If you have vertical targeting enabled, which can be selected through the options menu, that's controlled by this gun's targeting value as well. So let's look at what vertical targeting does. In the same way as horizontal convergence angles the guns inward to make all the bullets meet at the uh, targeting range, vertical targeting angles them upwards to allow for gravity, so the bullets drop to be level with your plane at that targeting range. Now that sounds really useful at first glance. Surely it'd be great not to have to allow for gravity with your aiming, right? Well, it's not that easy. If you're firing at a longer distance than the targeting range, you'll still have to aim a bit higher to allow for bullet drop. If you're engaging at close range, you'll actually have to aim a bit lower, though below the target, else your bullets will fly harmlessly above it. And if that's not complex enough, consider what happens if you're engaging on an angle, or diving, or climbing, or your plane's banked, or even upside down. Not to mention the fact that you'll be changing the gun's targeting distance for horizontal convergence as you switch between planes, and as a result, that'll really mess up your feel for vertical aiming. So generally speaking, I think vertical targeting is far more trouble than it's worth, and I have it turned off, as I prefer to simply allow for gravity myself. And how much should you lift your aim to allow for gravity? Well, I'll use the P400 as an example, given the range of weapons it carries. Light machine guns lose velocity quickly, so after around 300 metres they start to drop. American 50 cals are OK, out to about 400 metres, after which you'll have to start aiming a bit higher. Hispanos have a very high muzzle velocity, so it takes quite a while before gravity has an effect on them. Each weapon in War Thunder is different, so a bullet drop is simply something you're going to have to get used to. On planes with mixed guns like a P400, you'll need to either fire the machine gun separately from the cannon or simply get in close where the different ballistics properties won't matter as much. Before I move on, there's one more factor relating to weapons that's actually very important when it comes to aiming in War Thunder, and that's understanding and adapting to recoil. The main thing to consider here is that the bigger the gun and the higher the velocity of its shells, the greater the recoil will tend to be. Light machine guns don't have any recoil worth worrying about, and a plane with a bank of 50 cals will still usually be quite stable. It's when you get to cannon that things start to get interesting. The first thing to look at is the location of the cannon on your plane. If they're nose mounted, as they are on this KI-43-3 Otsu, the recoil will buck the nose upwards when you fire, as you can see by the movement of the crosshairs, or aiming reticle. And it's even clearer zoomed in. 
When the cannon are mounted on the wings, as they are with many British fighters, the recoil will force the nose down as the cannon are located below the plane's centre of gravity. This is especially obvious with the Spanos as they are high velocity cannon that have a kick like a mule. So how do you allow for recoil? Well if your plane's going to recoil upwards, aim a little lower than you otherwise would. And conversely if you're in a Spitfire you want to aim a little higher, or if you're making a banking deflection shot like this one, aim further ahead of the target as the recoil would bring your aim back toward it. Oh and before I forget, if you watch the first video in this series you'll know that I use the keyboard to fire my guns, not the mouse buttons. And why is that? Well, let me show you. Here I am firing the mouse button. And uh, using the mouse button, you can see the cursor wiggling around. It's quite hard for me to keep a steady aim. And now again, I'm firing with the keyboard, and the mouse is nice and stable. When I fire with the mouse, my hand tenses up, particularly if I have to adjust for recoil, and my mouse accuracy suffers as a result. If you have that problem, consider using the keyboard instead to fire. It helped me a lot, maybe it will for you as well. Am I ready to look at aiming yet? Almost. But before I do, one very important thing to consider is the sensitivity of your mouse. Firstly, you can set this in your control options, and the best way of doing that is to go into a test flight, see if the mouse movements are too jerky or maybe too sluggish, adjust the setting and then try again. But before you do that, if you're on a Windows machine, you might want to look in your control panel's mouse settings. In particular, under mouse pointer options, there's a checkbox called Enhance Pointer Precision, which is turned on by default. And what that will do is move your mouse by small increments when you're making fine adjustments and then accelerate the mouse if you move it a bit faster. And that sounds like it should be helpful in War Thunder, but in my experience, it simply made the mouse jump around and it was very difficult to keep it on target. Even though I'd used computers with this feature enabled for many years, it only took me a day or two to get used to it being off, and in War Thunder I saw an immediate benefit. And with that it's time to look at how to actually aim in War Thunder Arcade. Let's take a look at the various elements you'll see in Arcade using mouse aim. Firstly there's the aiming reticle, which basically shows where your plane is pointing. Then there's the mouse cursor, and except for when you're using the keyboard to move a tail control, mouse aim will continually try to move the aiming reticle toward the mouse cursor. And finally the small circle ahead of the enemy plane, which is called the lead indicator. This appears around 780 metres, it's only seen in arcade, and can be used not only for aiming your guns, but also showing you the heading and speed of the enemy plane relative to your own. Now let me say right here, I've always thought this feature was and is completely unnecessary in War Thunder. Most players are more than capable of figuring out how to lead targets without the aid of a circle showing you where to put your crosshairs. And not only that, the lead indicator is actually a bit misleading. And from my observations, it's accurate only to a range of around 300 metres. So let's look at a few examples. Now these will just be air-to-air kills, but I'll try to explain what's happening so that instead of simply seeing footage of planes losing their wings, you'll understand what I'm doing and why, and hopefully that'll help you practice the same techniques. So as you can see here, I'm intercepting an SPD, and because he's travelling at an angle to me, I'll lift up and roll to the left. Okay, now I can follow him by pitching upwards. I'm also in a position for a quick snapshot, aiming right at the lead indicator, as we're at close range. Looks like he's levelling off, so I'll roll to the right, and then hit him with a steady burst, again aiming at the lead indicator, as the range is less than 300 metres. I'll show you a series of close range examples. In this one I'm dropping on the target from above, aiming at the lead indicator, and he flies right into the path of my cannon shells. This is a typical turn fight situation. I've rolled left to match the direction of the target, and as his range is around 300 metres, I'm aiming right at the lead indicator. And then I can repeat exactly the same thing with a second target. I shoot at this Spitfire from 500 metres, but I'm not leading far enough in front of the indicator. And once I'm within 300 metres, my shells start to hit. Next, aiming at a dodging hurricane was not easy here, but once inside 300 metres, I start to land hits. It really does pay to get in close. It gets so much easier to score kills there. And yes, around 300 metres is my preferred engagement range and you can see why that's the case, but you can drop targets from further away. If you're beyond 300 metres range, you need to aim ahead of the lead indicator, which enables me to drop this uh, TBF from around 400 metres, and now a PBY from around the same distance, both by aiming a little ahead of the lead indicator, as you can see. In the next example, I'm attacking a Wellington, again leading ahead of the indicator as he approaches. In the next pass, I'll aim slightly above the indicator to allow for gravity, 
and to the left of it in order to target his engine and wing. Next dropping onto another bomber from above and aiming ahead of the indicator as I start firing from around 600 metres. And here's an example where I didn't lead ahead of the indicator far enough. As you can see I'm blazing away at 500 metres range or 600 while my reticle is aimed almost exactly at the indicator circle when it should be a good distance in front of it. Every shell I'm firing here is falling short as a result, but as I begin to close into the target, still aiming at the reticle, at around 300 metres my shells begin to connect. So beyond 300 metres you need to aim ahead of the indicator, and the further away you are the greater amount of lead is required. OK, so let's look at a few longer range shots. And this example of BF-109 is extending away from me, and I'm not going to catch him. So at 500 metres I open fire, aiming a good distance ahead of the lead indicator. Here a P-39 is climbing up underneath me. I dive and engage from 600 metres, although it's probably the shots from around 500 metres that connect and destroy the target. To be honest, long range engagements are not my forte, so for better examples I'll show you some footage contributed by Flip, who's a true expert at this kind of thing. Starting with a series of head-on engagements. He opens fire at 1.3 kilometres, aiming above the target and then dropping his aim gradually as he closes in before ducking away just before the lead indicator is visible. Then the same thing again. This last kill is a bit of a tricky shot as the enemy plane will turn toward him from underneath. Flip doesn't wait for the lead indicator to appear, he just opens fire at where he believes the other plane is likely to go. This is another example of long-range shooting. The target's at 600 metres, flying away from him and in a shallow dive. And look where Flip is aiming. Almost the same distance ahead of the lead indicator circle as the circle is from the plane. And if you think about it, that makes sense. If the lead indicator works at 300 metres range, then at 600 metres, you want to lead by twice that amount. Anyway, let's see what happens. It's almost magical. And here's TX-141 doing exactly the same thing with a KO-44. The target's at around 600 metres range, and look how much he's leading ahead of the indicator. Now here I'm going to get a bit silly and show you some examples of extremely long-range gunnery. This is Flip once again, and yes he's firing at a target at 1.6 kilometres away, and yes he makes it look rather easy, although the target is approaching him. I showed you that just to give you an idea of what was, poss what was possible, not to encourage you to spray and pray. It's much better to practice good gunnery habits and closer range engagements first. Get those mastered, and maybe later you can try taking those longer shots. Now this is some footage sent to me by Jovial Witness. Each time he shoots a plane down, I want you to concentrate on the roll angle of his plane relative to the target, on the target's range when he opens fire, how much he's leading the indicator relative to that range, and the allowance he makes for gravity. OK, closing in on this G5N at an oblique angle, he aims ahead of the indicator but not quite far enough as he opens fire at 700 metres. He only starts to hit when he gets a bit closer. Next he's in a fast, low yo-yo attack on a P-51, which has tried to climb away from him. Note how he's leading well in front of the target before he gets into range. It's much easier to pull your aim back if you lead too far in front, than to increase your lead if you haven't allowed enough. Dropping on a B-25 from above, Jovial rolls as he dives to avoid having to pitch down when he aims. There he goes. Another diving attack, this time on a Spitfire, and Jovial doesn't quite lead far enough when he opens fire at 600 metres, so his cannon shells miss until he's close to 400 metres range. And while he attacks a P-63, I just want to comment on the effect that ping has on your aiming. Do you see any difference in how Jovial, with an 80 millisecond ping, is aiming compared to TX-141 with 50, or Flip with 70, or me with a ping of 270? There is no difference. The exact same amount of lead works regardless of ping. And for a server-side game, that may seem illogical, but as Gaijin's CEO himself explained in an interview a few weeks ago, it's because they've implemented a feature called Host State Rewind on their servers, and I'll leave that for you to look up if you're interested. The point is, you can practice aiming even in a test flight mission editor battle which has zero ping and then use exactly the same techniques and lead distances on a server with a ping of over 400 milliseconds. Hit detection certainly won't be as good as that gets significantly worse the higher your ping, but aiming remains consistent. And I definitely recommend mission editor battles as a way to improve your aiming. 
That feature is accessible through test flight and it allows you to shoot down as many AI uh, flown planes as you want. And it doesn't matter if you get shot down, what you'll get is a ton of planes to shoot one after another. It's amazing how quickly that will improve your skills. So if you have trouble aiming, try to keep in mind the things I've shown you here and consciously practice them, starting with closer range engagements rather than long range spray and pray. Oh, and one last thing. If you're thinking of moving to realistic battles, don't get used to the lead indicator. It does not exist in RB, and aiming is a totally different proposition when there's no crutch, uh, I mean guide, to assist you. I'd like to thank the three expert pilots who are featured in this video, Flip, tx one for one and Jovia Witness. Links to their channels can be found in the description text below. I do suggest checking them out. Anyway, I look forward to reading your comments. I've uh, tried to cover every aspect, but if I've missed something, please feel free to point it out. And if you'd like to support the creation of these videos, there's a link to my Patreon page in the description. And thank you to all who supported me thus far. It's much appreciated. Anyway, that's all I have in this video. Keep your head calm, keep your aim steady, and I will see you in the skies.